purpose of this video is to provide an overview of the standards, intended pacing, and sample instructional strategies for Unit 7, Geometry and the Coordinate Plane. In this portion of the video, we are going to review the AKS and Indicators of Achievement, or IOAs, for Unit 7. The AKS is the overarching knowledge and skills that students are expected to master. The IOAs are the learning objectives that allow students to demonstrate mastery of the AKS. The AKS and IOAs may not be taught in their entirety the first time they appear on the instructional calendar. Some AKS and IOAs will appear multiple times throughout the year. In Chapter 2 of the video, we will look to see how the AKS and IOAs in this unit are paced in detail. Unit 7 has two AKS. Under the AKS, you will find the Indicators of Achievement, or IOAs. Take note that we focus more on the IOAs because in order for students to show mastery of an AKS, they need the building blocks of the IOAs. You will also see that we have provided you with the state coding at the end of the IOAs so that if you are looking up resources on the Georgia DOE website, you are able to find the state IOA that is related to the GCBS IOA. Our first AKS in the unit, 5MAB6, has two IOAs. IOA 6A introduces students to the structure of the coordinate plane and the convention and notation of coordinates to name points. With IOA 6B, students generate two different numerical patterns and identify relationships between the corresponding terms within those patterns. Students will also plot ordered pairs from generated patterns. The second AKS in this unit, 5MAD8, has four IOAs. IOAs 8C and 8D, focusing on volume, were taught during quarter one. In unit seven, the remaining two IOAs are taught. With 8A, students have the opportunity to build on their understanding of shapes to classify, compare, and contrast polygons based on properties. With IOA 8B, students will explore geometric properties of shapes to determine relationships between categories and subcategories of shapes. Students are no longer expected to create a hierarchy for polygons in this unit. At the end of quarter four, students will also revisit whole number division. Due to this year being a transition year, students will be introduced to the standard algorithm for division to prepare students for sixth grade. Please note that students are not expected to master the standard algorithm for division in fifth grade. Pacing guide is an example intended to model how instruction of the AKS IOAs in each unit may be facilitated. But teachers should design pacing to be responsive to the learning needs of your students. Unit 7 has a suggested pacing of about four weeks. There are 20 given days of instruction on the pacing guide, including the Unit 7 assessment. Please take note that the Analyzing the Standard documents have been linked at the top of the pacing guide. They can also be found inside lesson plans in this unit. The bullets on the left side of the pacing guide show the learning progression of the AKS IOAs for each unit and suggest manipulatives and tools. For Unit 7, you will need color tiles and or red-yellow counters, graph paper, angle legs, and geoboards. Unit 7 pacing begins with IOA 6B, in which students will explore the structure and functionality of the coordinate plane at the concrete level. This will include identifying and describing features of the coordinate plane that include the X and Y coordinates and X and Y axis, synonymous terms, as well as the point of origin. Next, Students will progress to a representational day, also with IOA 6B, in which students are describing those features of the coordinate plane, and but using the coordinate plane to determine the ordered pair associated with a point. So on this day and in these two days, really getting an understanding of 
all of the components and features of the coordinate plane, and students will not only graph ordered pairs on the coordinate plane, but they will also identify and locate points that already exist on the coordinate plane. Please remember we are only focusing on the first quadrant of the coordinate plane in fifth grade. On the third day of the progression, we will shift our attention to IOA 6A, in which uh, students are beginning patterns concretely, and this includes generating two numerical patterns using two given rules. We also want our students to be able to identify relationships between corresponding terms by completing a table. And you will see this modeled later in this video. This will then transition to representational, continuing to focus on using a table to generate a pattern. So and again, in fourth grade, students generated a pattern with one given rule, and fifth grade students are generating two numerical patterns using two given rules. And then plotting points after, after taking the patterns in our table and turning them into ordered pairs. That work will continue. So you note at this point that 6A and 6B are being taught together concurrently as we are not only generating patterns, um, two patterns from uh, given rules, but we are also graphing those ordered pairs in the first quadrant of the coordinate plane. And then we also be able to analyze those, those coordinates to be able to predict um, how to extend those patterns. Um, and the final piece is not only are we really digging into understanding how to extend a pattern in each table when they are side by side, but we also, so thinking um, if the pattern is represented vertically, but we also want to think about how the patterns relate to each other. So how one pattern relates or to the other pattern. What is the um, relationship between those two patterns? So you will see that work also with AKS 6 and IOA 6A and 6B. After eight days with IOAs 6A and 6B, Unit 7 transitions to IOAs 8A and 8B um, and our exploration of polygons. So our polygon, our work with polygons is going to begin with a lesson on regular versus irregular polygons based on attributes. So this includes number of sides, can include number of angles, regular versus irregular. So all of those um, attributes of all the different polygons that are included in this unit, which include triangles, quadrilaterals, pentagons, and hexagons. So at this point, we are classifying, comparing, and contrasting polygons based on properties. But that first day is really just a focus on regular versus irregular. It is a concrete and representational lesson. Then we will exclusively focus on triangles, looking at um, exclusively the focus will be on classifying, comparing, and contrasting polygons based on their properties before doing a second day of triangles. And this time we're really focusing on those inclusive definitions and really thinking about larger categories with triangles. So really um, adding some complexity to the way we're classifying, comparing and contrasting polygons based on properties. In this case, we're gonna use some T-charts to sort shapes based on given attributes and moving from more general attributes to the most specific. Then we will shift to quadrilaterals. So just like with triangles, that first day is really just is just really understanding the attributes um, of each quadrilateral, the, the definitions. We're going to do some classifying, comparing, and contrasting the polygons based on their properties. And then we will continue to kind of shift and add some complexity. So we'll start to reason about polygons and their attributes and begin to explore and investigate categories and subcategories of two-dimensional figures using attributes. So this is where we will start to kind of um, add some um, complexity to the way we are describing different quadrilaterals in this unit. So please note though that while students, there, it can seem in this unit that students are working with hierarchies, students are not expected to 
recreate a hierarchy for all the polygons they see in this unit. That is no longer an expectation for fifth graders. So after really digging into triangles and quadrilaterals, I'm going to transition to continuing to investigate categories and subcategories of all two-dimensional figures using attributes. So really digging deep with quadrilaterals specifically and subcategorizing quadrilaterals. So some of that may be familiar from last year, but do again remember, we're not specifically focused on recreating a hierarchy. And then bef when you, before you get to the end of the unit, we will, we will be working with all polygons and you will have um, see some tasks and lessons that really focus on um, the attributes of all polygons and how to categorize and subcategorize all the polygons in this unit. At the very end of the pacing, you will see an IOA2B from quarter two coming back into play. Um, the reason for this is we are in a transitional year with our new standards. Um, so we want our students to be ready for middle school and ready for sixth grade. So we want to make sure that they have this year, they have some exposure to the standard algorithm, which will be introduced Full, more fully in middle school. But so we have a lesson here connecting partial quotients to the standard algorithm for division. And this is really to help our students be ready for sixth grade. So let's dig into some instructional strategies that you will see in this unit. And while we won't be looking at every strategy from Unit 7 in this video, I will be modeling strategies for each of the IOAs discussed earlier in this video. First, we're going to look at IOAs 6A and 6B, focusing on the coordinate plane, graphing in the coordinate plane, and analyzing numerical patterns when given a rule. So first, let's talk about at the beginning of the unit. I told you that you would be kind of launching into it with just an understanding of the structure of the coordinate plane. So that includes some vocabulary that we want to make sure that our students are very, very um, comfortable with. And so these words uh, are not are not limited to, but include um, the point of origin, which is always um, at zero on the x-axis and zero on the y-axis. So I've labeled the x-axis and the y-axis. So x-axis along here moving horizontally and then the y-axis moving vertically. So if you are working with a high population of ML students on ECOM, on the math general office page, you can find some vocabulary cards in English, Spanish, French, and Chinese to support your students. And they include all of these words. So if I want to plot a point in the first quadrant of the coordinate plane, I always want to point out to my students I'm starting at my point of origin, and I'm going to move along the x-axis before the y-axis X comes before Y alphabetically is a way to kind of help students keep that keep track of that. So if I wanted to plot the ordered pair, I'm going to write it up here. I want to plot four, five. Then I would want to start at zero, zero, zero. So this is actually, if I was labeling the origin, I would label it as zero, zero zero on the x-axis and zero on the y-axis. And I'm gonna move first along the x-axis. So my four represents my x and my five represents my y. So I'm gonna move over to the four on the x-axis. And then I wanna move up one, two, three, four, five, and place my point. So not only do we want our students to be very comfortable with all the parts of the coordinate plane we all, and how to plot points on the coordinate plane, they also need to be able to locate points on the coordinate plane. So you'll see this is from a task on day one of the progression. This is part of um, IOA 6B. So if I want to identify or locate where th these specific food items are that are kind of representing points on this coordinate plane. Again, I want to start at the point of origin. 
Remember that also is the same as representing zero, zero as an ordered pair, zero on the x-axis and zero on the y, it's where they meet. And so I'm gonna find the location of the grapes. So thinking again, I wanna move along the x-axis first. So I see that I could move over to the five and it's above the five. So I would know that my x coordinate here would be five. And then I'm gonna move up one, two, because I can see that along this y-axis, the grapes are next to the two. So I would write this as five comma two, put parentheses around it, and identifies it as an ordered pair. And of course, ordered pairs are how we identify our name points on the coordinate plane. So now let's shift our attention to IOA 6A, generating two numerical patterns using a given rule. So let's take a look at this problem. Pattern A starts at zero and adds one to each term. Pattern B starts at zero and adds five to each term. How can you determine a relationship between corresponding terms of these numerical patterns? And this problem is from Georgia Reveal, one of your Georgia Reveal resources and is in a lesson on the pacing guide. So with a problem like this, I, I want to use a two-column table. So it says pattern A starts at zero and adds one to each term. So I'm going to make a two-column table because I do have two columns here. So I'm going to label one pattern A. I'm going to label the other one pattern B. So I know that pattern A starts at zero and adds one to each term. So on the next row, I know that each time it's going up by one. So that given rule here is it's add one. Pretty basic pattern. For pattern B, it also starts at zero and adds five to each term. So I know that each term after this one, I have to add five. So it's the same as counting by fives. So I can connect this to skip counting. That is one way I can extend this pattern. So zero, five, five more would be 10, another five, 15, and another five would be 20. So looking back at my question, so I've generated two patterns. I could have extended these further, but I did it just enough so that you can see how I can use some skip counting to extend these patterns. That is one way. Again, let me label this one. This one was add five. So we want our students to be really comfortable being able to extend these patterns for using a given rule, think vertically, and on both sides. But now I want to think about the relationship between um, pattern A and pattern B. So what is the relationship between the corresponding terms? So when I say corresponding terms, I'm talking about like, the term on in pattern A that corresponds with the term for pattern B. So zero to zero doesn't really give me much help. So let me take a look at the next one. So I can see that column A has a one and column B has a five. And then the next column, I see a two and a, then a 10 for column B, and then three and 15 and four and 20. So how does this term relate to this one? Well, I can tell in my head, I'm thinking, well, I know that one times five is five. So in my head, I'm thinking, hmm, can I multiply the terms in column A by five to find out the terms in column B? But for that to be true, it needs to be consistently working all the way down. It needs to always be true. Not just sometimes, maybe just in the first term, because sometimes our students may stop after thinking they found a relationship with the first set of terms and they don't continue to see if it works. So we wanna make sure that we are modeling for our students. We wanna make sure that, that the relationship has to be consistent and work all the way down. So if I'm thinking one times five is five, but I also, let me take that times five, does that work here? So two times five is 10. So that does work. 
3 times 5 would be 15, and 4 times 5 would be 20. So I can see that times 5 is consistently working. So I might ask a question like, if, if I know that the relationship between the corresponding terms is that I can multiply that A is 5 times, or sorry, B is 5 times the value of A, and A is 1 -fifth the value of B, then I could use that rule to possibly predict another term further down in the pattern. So I'm saying I want to know if can I predict or determine, not predict, excuse me, how do I know what the term in pattern B will be if, let's say, the term in pattern A was 8, can I use what I know about the relationship here to determine this? Well, if I know that I multiply A times 5, I can find out the, pat the, the term in, in pattern B. So if I were to multiply this 8 times 5, I know that that equals 40. So I'm able to now determine other terms in the pattern that are farther down. I could even, if I wanted to go really big, I might even say, I know that if A was 100 and I multiply that by 5, then B would be 500. So I can determine without having to just continue to name 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way to 100, because I know the relationship here, I can now determine terms much farther on or farther into the patterns and much um, with much larger numbers. So let's shift gears a bit. We've talked about how to extend a pattern vertically. We've talked about how to analyze the relationship between corresponding terms and two numerical patterns when given a rule. So there's one more way we can also determine um, uh, that we can extend a pattern. So we're going to be bringing back in um, what we worked on with IOA 6B and the coordinate plane. So take a look at this problem. Aaliyah is at the 30th floor of a building. While waiting for the elevator, she collected the data shown in the table. How many minutes will it take the elevator to reach Aaliyah's floor? So I can see that after zero minutes, she was not at any floor. She hadn't gone anywhere. After one minute, she was on the fifth floor. After two minutes, the 10th floor. Three minutes, 15th floor. And four minutes, the 20th floor. So yes, I can right away see that this pattern is very similar to the one that I just, it's the same pattern as what I just did. Different problem. So I can see that the rules here seems to be to add one, and I can see that the rule here seems to be to add five, in both cases starting at zero. But there's a different way I can look at this. So I'm going to use what I know about graphing in the coordinate plane to help me determine what might be the next terms in these patterns. So one way I would do this is I want to convert all of the terms in my chart into ordered pairs. And of course, these ordered pairs I will then be using to graph. So again, I want to include 0, 0, and I'm going to start at the origin. And you can see the terms 1 and 5 here, representing the x and what would be the x and y axis when I'm graphing, is coming straight from my table. So helping students make this connection and making sure that they're being accurate with their creation of ordered pairs. So with that being said, I'm then able to plot those points in the first quadrant of the coordinate plane. So you see I started with 0, and then we plotted 1, 5. So that's 1 along the x-axis and 5 along the y. So over 1 up to the 5. So you see all these points have been plotted straight from ordered pairs, which came from the two patterns that were generated there. So I can actually use this. I can see a pattern here. So I'm projecting, I'm noticing that the that I know that my first pattern is increasing by one and my second one is increasing by five, but I can go ahead and predict based on the direction of the points that the next one is going to be here. And the next point is going to be here. So I'm gonna come back to that in just a moment, but I want you to notice 
the way I was able to do that is once those first few points were plotted, I drew a line, I would draw a line to connect them, and I'm going to extend that line out beyond that last point I plotted before I added these two points. And so I do that because it helps me see the trend and it helps me kind of notice um, and analyze my graph. So taking a note of that, I can notice that the points I've added were, if I move along the x-axis to five and up to 25. So let me write that over here to the side for a moment. And then I can move over to six on the x-axis and walk up up, up the y-axis to 30. So what does this mean? So I'm able to continue to project the direction of this line based on how I plotted these points and the pattern. So I'm going back to my original chart here. And I know that if I'm extending this by one and this one by five, you can see, and this is a way I can check to see I was able to correctly project and determine how to extend the pattern using the coordinate grid and how I plotted my points. You can see the 630 would be next as well. Again, I also was able to could have considered the relationship between these two. So I know that this pattern is five times the value of this one. So I could have extended it that way, but I actually, instead of going at that route, I also was able to plot points on the coordinate grid and extend the pattern right here on the coordinate grid. Now let's take a look at the second part of Unit 7, where we will explore geometry. Students have had experience sorting, classifying, analyzing, comparing, and contrasting 2D and 3D shapes to some degree since kindergarten. This has been done using informal language in kinder and more formal language in all grades after to describe shapes using attributes or properties. Students classified shapes initially by counting the number of sides, angles, and vertices within the shapes, then moved into a more in-depth analysis of those attributes, such as the types of lines found in shapes like parallel or perpendicular, or the types of angles, such as acute right and obtuse, students then started to see the relationship between shapes who share attributes. Fifth grade is where we are going to bring it all together. We're going to take this work of classifying, comparing, and contrasting polygons by the absence or presence of attributes to determine that polygons that all share the same attributes can be classified into a subcategory. For example, a square can be a subcategory of a rhombus because it has all the attributes of a rhombus. This means that the attributes belonging to a category of a 2D figure also belong to all subcategories of that category. Using square and rhombus example, this would mean that because all squares are rhombi, then all squares must have four congruent sides. Previously, we showed this work by creating a hierarchy. With our new standards, students are not required to create a hierarchy. We now show this relationship using Venn diagrams and words. So let's get to it. The first part of this standard that I would like to model is from a lesson that recaps quadrilaterals. Using a line segment, a term that students were introduced to in fourth grade, on a geo board, students are to create quadrilaterals. This particular lesson starts with an active engagement first. This gives students an opportunity to show what they already know about quadrilaterals. As students are creating quadrilaterals, be looking for specific examples of a trapezoid, parallelogram, rectangle, rhombi, and squares. Prompt students to talk with partners about the different names of the quadrilaterals and why they chose that name. Then you have the choice of sharing the names and attribute of each quadrilateral with the class in an explicit teach or allow students to share. Only after you have ensured that they have the correct names and attributes. So up first we have a trapezoid. Students are to take a line segment and create a quadrilateral. One quadrilateral that they could create is a trapezoid. 
Now, the definition of a, a trapezoid is a quadrilateral with at least one pair of parallel sides. This top side is parallel to the bottom side. I can show that using an arrow. Top is parallel to the bottom. We use one arrow here, one arrow here to show that these two are parallel. Please note that the reveal curriculum, the adoption that we um, have for math, uses the exclusive definition of trapezoid, and our standard uses the inclusive definition. Again, the inclusive definition says that any quadrilateral with at least one pair of parallel sides can be classified as a trapezoid. The next quadrilateral that students could create is a parallelogram. A parallelogram is a quadrilateral that has both pairs of opposite sides are congruent. This shows that the top side is, excuse me, parallel to the bottom side. The left side is parallel to the right side. We represented that with one arrow to show the top and bottom are parallel, and then two arrows to show that the left and right are parallel. A student could also create a rhombus. A rhombus is a quadrilateral with two pairs of parallel sides, and all four sides are congruent, are equal in length. Here we show, we use the hash mark to show congruent sides. We use one because all four sides are congruent. We use the arrows to show parallel sides. This side is parallel to this side, and this side, denoted with two arrows, is parallel to this side. We can also create a rectangle. A rectangle is a quadrilateral with two pairs of parallel sides and four right angles. Here we have the top side is parallel to the bottom, so we have one arrow, and then we have the left side is parallel to the right side, shown with two arrows. We also have our square corners to show that each angle is a 90 degree angle. We can also create a square from the line segment. We know that a square is a quadrilateral with four equal sides and four right angles. Here, we have the one hash mark to show congruent sides. Each side is only one because they're all congruent. And then we use the arrow, one arrow, to show that the top is parallel to the bottom side and the left is parallel to the right side. These are our, our attributes for a square. One quadrilateral that your students may not um, create from a line segment is a kite. A kite, so you may have to create it for them and give them the example. A kite is a quadrilateral with two pairs of equal length or congruent sides that are adjacent, share a vertex to each other. So this side, is congruent to this side. We use that, we use one hash mark for each to show that. Both of the sides share a vertex, so that means they are adjacent. So that's the first pair. We use the second, the two hash marks to show these two sides are congruent. This side is the same length as this side, and they share a vertex. So this means they are adjacent. Both sides, this quadrilateral has two pairs of parallel sides that are adjacent. This is why we classify this quadrilateral as a kite. Use this time to create an anchor chart to refer back to as you progress through the unit. 
Students will also get an opportunity to explore and recap their understanding of triangles as well. Now we will move into the comparing and contrasting component of IOA 8A. Through comparing the attributes of quadrilaterals and triangles, students will begin to see that polygons in different categories can have shared attributes. Later, students will use this understanding to make subcategories based on those relationships, which is part of IOA 8B. For this example, we have some polygons that share an attribute. We are to determine that attribute by comparing those polygons to each other and then telling how they differ from the polygons that are non-examples. Finally, we're going to determine which of these shapes has that mystery attribute. So looking at those first polygons, we're going to compare those polygons and record their attributes in, that they share in this T-chart. I've labeled it example for all the attributes that are present in those shapes, and then non-example to record the attributes that are not present in these shapes, but are present in our non-examples. So the first attributes that we want to tell our students to take note of our lines of symmetry, which is a new focus um, for every grade level, uh, previous grade levels, the sides and the angles. This is the thinking that we will use throughout the progression. So I'm looking at my square first, and I'm thinking about the lines of symmetry. I know that a square has four lines of symmetry. If students are having trouble with seeing lines of symmetry, you can actually blow these up, make them a little bigger, and fold them to show the lines of symmetry. And to show that they, if we fold them, they take up the same amount of space. So a square has four lines of symmetry. A rectangle has two lines of symmetry. And this trapezoid has one line of symmetry. Now, looking at each of these shapes and trying to determine what we could say about, as it relates to lines of symmetry, we could say that each one of these shapes in the examples has at least one um, line of symmetry. So I'll record that under the examples. All right, now we're going to look at our sides. Now, I can just see that each of these shapes in the our polygons in the examples with the examples are quadrilaterals, but so are our non-examples. So we're going to take a deeper look at our sides. And one way we can do that is look to look for congruency or pairs of congruent sides. Now, we know that a square has four congruent sides. So that means it has two pairs of congruent sides, sides that are the same length. So I'm going to use the one hash mark to show all sides are congruent. With our tri excuse me, with our rectangle, the top side is congruent to the bottom side, and the left is congruent to the right. So the rectangle has two pairs of congruent sides. Our trapezoid has one pair of congruent sides. So what could we say about congruency as it relates to our examples? We could say that each of these have at least one pair of congruent sides. So I'll record that under example. Mm 
Um, we can also look at the absence and presence of parallel sides. To determine if um, a shape has pairs of parallel sides, we look at the opposite sides and we can extend them to see if they um, touch. They're the exact same, they're same distance apart. They will never intersect. So these sides are parallel. With a square, we know the top is parallel to the bottom and the left is parallel to the right. So a square has two uh, two pairs of parallel sides. We can show those with our arrows. So the top is parallel to the bottom and the left, we're gonna use two, is parallel, getting a little busy there, is parallel to the right. The same is true for our rectangle. The top is congruent, I'm sorry, is parallel to the bottom side and the left is parallel to the right. So the rectangle has two pairs of parallel sides. Now, with our trapezoid, we know that this top is parallel to the bottom. So we'll use one arrow there. Then to show the top is parallel, which would represent that the top is parallel to the bottom. But if we look at the left and we extend those sides and the right, they intersect. So the trapezoid, this trapezoid has one pair of parallel sides. So what can be said about all of our polygons? We could say that all of these polygons have at least one pair of parallel sides. We also said that we would like for our students to look at angles and the type of angles. We see that our square has all right angles, and I can show that with square corners, right? It's getting a little busy in here, though. But our square has all right angles. Our rectangle has all right angles. But this trapezoid has two acute angles and two obtuse angles. So they don't share an attribute as it relates to angles. So we'll leave that off. Now let's move on to our non-examples. When we move to the non-examples, we know that the mystery attribute that we are looking for will not be found in these shapes. So if we see an attribute that we recorded in the examples, um, we know that we can eliminate it from the list. So let's go with symmetry first. Both of these polygons have at least one line of symmetry. So we know that that cannot be the mystery attribute because it neither of these shapes have the mystery attribute. So now let's move on to the sides, the congruent sides. Now this is a kite and we learned that a kite has two pairs of congruent sides that share a vertex. So that means they're adjacent. So this side is congruent to this side, and then this side is congruent to that side. Now, we also have congruent sides on this side. This one is congruent or the same length as this side. And then these are the same length. So that can't be our mystery attribute because, again, neither of these shapes are supposed to have um, that mystery attribute. So now we're going to move on to the last one, at least one pair of parallel sides. Hmm. If we look at the sides and the, op the opposite sides, 
we need to extend them to see if they would intersect. And you can always use an extra sheet of paper as well, or a other straight edge. Use this one. And we see that these will, if we extend them, they will get a little messy, intersect. And the same is true for this shape. They don't, it's hard to even pick the opposite sides here because they go across the shape. So neither of these sides have any pairs of parallel sides. So for our non-example, they have no parallel sides. So I'll record that here. No parallel sides. So this must be our um, mystery attribute. So here's um, actually one place um, where, um, well, let's go on. This is one place where they start to make those connections. We can remind students that the definition of a trapezoid is a quadrilateral that has at least one pair of parallel sides. And because each one of these polygons have that attribute, we can categorize these, the square, the rectangle, all as trapezoids. So that's where that pre-work is starting. Um, so when we go to the last part of this and it says, which of these have it? So which of these have the attribute or the mystery attribute, attribute of at least one pair of parallel sides or can be classified as a trapezoid? We know the rhombus has this attribute of at least one pair of parallel sides because both pair, they have two pairs of parallel sides. This shape does not because if we extend those lines, they would intersect. This Does this trapezoid have at least one pair of parallel sides? Yes. So because they both have at least one parallel side, and that is how we classify tra uh, trapezoids, we can call each of these shapes trapezoids as well. Here's where it all comes together. Through exploration, students will see that we can classify polygons, both triangles and quadrilaterals, into subcategories because they possess all the attributes of the main category. Here's what that looks like. We start with the category of closed shapes or polygons with four sides, four angles, and four vertices. We call those polygons quadrilaterals. Then we have trapezoids. In order to be classified as a trapezoid, a polygon needs to be a quadrilateral and have at least one pair of parallel sides. That's it. This means that we can, a parallelogram is a subcategory of a trapezoid because we know that a parallelogram is a quadrilateral that has two pairs of parallel sides. Well, both a rectangle and a rhombus can be subcategories of a parallelogram because they both are quadrilaterals that have two pairs of parallel sides. So we know they meet the requirements of the trapezoid who only requires one pair. Now, a rhombus is not a subcat a rhombus is not a subcategory of a rectangle because a rhombus does not have to have four right angles. A rectangle is not a subcategory of a rhombus either because a rectangle does not have to have all congruent sides like a rhombus. So this is why I place them side by side within the parallelism. However, we did learn that a square is a subcategory of a rectangle because a square is a quadrilateral with two pairs of parallel sides 
and four right angles. These are the attributes of a rectangle. A square is also a subcategory of a rhombus because a square is a quadrilateral with two pairs of parallel sides that are all equal, which are all the attributes of a rhombus. But what about the kite? A kite has to be a quadrilateral with two pairs of equal length sides that are adjacent. That means we cannot subcategorize a kite with the other polygons because it doesn't have to have any parallel sides. So I'll place it here. It does not meet, the kite does not meet any of the, um, does not meet the required attributes, but it is a quadrilateral. So that's why I can place it here. Now, can we subcategorize a square as a kite? Pause the vid video and explore. Resume the video when you're ready with your answer. What did you decide? Is a square a subcategory of a kite? Well, does it possess all the attributes of a kite? Is it a quad? Yes, it is. Does it have two pairs of equal length sides that are adjacent? Well, we know that all the sides are congruent. All sides are equal. So there are two pairs of equal length sides that are adjacent because they're all congruent. These two are adjacent. They share the same um, vertex. And these two are adjacent and they say, share the same vertex. So yes, a, a square is a subcategory of a kite. In mathematics, the emphasis is on reasoning and thinking about the quantities within mathematical contexts. Specific mathematics strategies for teaching and learning are not mandated by the Georgia Department of Education or assessed on state or federally mandated tests. Students may solve problems in different ways and have the flexibility to choose a mathematical strategy that allows them to make sense of and strategically solve problems using efficient methods that are most comfortable for and make sense to them. It is critical that teachers and parents remain partners to help each child grow to become a mathematically literate citizen. These standards preserve and affirm local control and flexibility. Thank you for watching. Please use your phone to scan the QR code on the screen or go to the website shown to get your completion credit in PD&E.